Special Agents Podcast. Is the American dream of home ownership dead? Well, I have been posting a lot of uh, sharing, I should say, sharing videos, sharing commentary from uh, probably the Gen Z generation. I think it's probably young millennials and Gen Z and the sentiment, Mike, is consistent. I also have two Gen Z daughters who also share in the sentiment and the sentiment in today's economy, today's world, is that the American dream of home, home ownership from their perspective, based upon the metrics, based upon the way the economy is and uh, the, the lack of inflation on, 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 on their pay uh, versus the, in, the costs of, of interest rates, the cost of homes, the, you know all the things. And they just believe that when compared to our generations, uh, that that would be Gen X and, and baby boomers, mm -hmm. that it's just not the same and therefore unattainable. And so we decided, uh, you decided, you reached out and said, let's let's dedicate an episode to talk about why it's not dead. And hopefully we can enlighten and enrich uh, the real estate community so you can regurgitate this stuff to teach these younger generations that you got two options. It's mm -hmm. become a homeowner and, and share in that wealth or let the government via platforms like BlackRock do it, and they just effectively own you. Yeah. So we're bringing back Mike Litton, the Mike Litton experience. You already know him. He doesn't need an introduction. <laughs> Mike, let's get down to it, brother. I know we're live on your TikTok right now. So uh, yeah. we've got we've got audiences all over the place here. Yeah, we do. So I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for bringing me back on. And I reached out to you because of something that you had posted, which was a which was a snippet of a video that a young man posted, and he's in his early twenties, and he's working full time, and he's not able to make ends meet, and he's struggling, and so he was frustrated. And you know, the challenge that we have is we we lived right. We went through all this. We were in the same boat, and we talked about this before we hit record, but. We, went, we were in the same boat where we worked really hard. We worked our, our long hours. We did all that. And we didn't necessarily, we weren't necessarily able to make ends meet. We weren't necessarily able to afford the extras, right? And one of the things in particular that we weren't able to afford um, was buying a house. And so, which is, you know, for a lot of people, the largest investment they'll ever make. So what I wanted to talk about was sort, sort of some of the things that I've seen over the last 32 years that we've done. And one of them in particular is, you know, there's a, there's a phrase, um, th there's a phrase called it takes a village, right? And it's basically where you get your family involved. And what I wanted to talk about specifically was, you know, the, the baby boomer generation, it we're, we're right now in the middle of the single largest transfer of wealth in our nation's history. There's some $98 trillion estimated that's being of wealth that's being transferred from baby boomers to their millennial kids and grandkids. Okay. A lot of that, a large percentage of that is real estate and the millennials don't want it because they don't trust it. Okay. And so there are a lot of millennials out there. If you talk to them, they'll tell you, look, when I was a kid, I watched people around me that I love dearly lose their houses. I watched my grandparents. I watched my aunts. I watched my uncles. I watched my pastor. I watched all these people that I care deeply about, my best friend's family, right? You know, there were a lot of disruptions that happened in 2008. And so one of the things that also happened was it also scarred and gave PTSD to a lot of these millennials that are now that are now at the age where they're starting to do a thing we call household creation, right? Where they're starting to have babies and they're starting to get married and they're, they're doing it later in life, but they're doing all those things. And so... What I feel like is incredibly important is that we focus on the fact that it takes a village and there's some $98 trillion in wealth out there, trillion with a T, right, estimated, that's currently being transferred. So here's the thing. I'm not necessarily suggesting if you're a millennial or a Gen Z or whatever that you necessarily go out hat in hand and ask for somebody to gift you money for a down payment or co-sign with you on a house or any of that kind of thing. But I would like to suggest to you that it is possible. So several years ago, I worked with a young couple. They had no money. Their family, their immediate family, their parents had no money. And so I sat with them and the husband said, look, Mike, I, I don't know how to say this to you, but 
we don't have any money. My my family, my parents don't have any money. They've struggled all their lives. You know, there's no way, right? They're, they're not going to be able to help me. And so asking them for a gift would just be more like rubbing salt in the wound. And I said, well, let's do this. Let's go find whoever it is in your immediate family that writes the Christmas letter. And let's have them write a real quick letter, letting letting people know that you and your and your fiance are in the market to buy a house. Not that you're asking for anything, just that you're in the market to buy a house and let people know just as an update, hey, this is what's happening in August of this year, okay? And so they did that. And it turned out that there was an Aunt Meredith that he had in Ohio that was his sis, his mom's sister, okay? She had, or pardon me, her da his dad's sister. His dad's sister had never gotten married, never had kids, right? Which means she's got a ton of money. I'm joking. So, right, for those of us that raise children, <laughs> yeah, it's a little expensive. So, but she had no money. So what, or she had, a, what she did was she lived in Ohio. She was very understated. She was very shy. She was very quiet. She went out when he was born and she put $1,000 in a bank account. That $1,000 was now worth over 20 grand. OK, the kid was now was now of age and she was going to gift it to him when he decided to get married and or buy a house. Well, they weren't getting married yet, but they were buying a house together. OK, Aunt Meredith reached out to the to mom or to dad and said, hey, brother, I have twenty thousand dollars for him. Let him know what do I need to do to gift it to him. OK, that twenty thousand dollars, Jeff, made the deal work. It was his down payment, it was his closing costs, and it was his reserves. He came out of pocket with zero dollars out of his pocket, okay? Now let's talk about co-signing for a second. There are families that help their, their kids qualify to buy. And I'm gonna give you an example that's near and dear to my heart. I just sold my house, to, closed on it two weeks ago, okay? What was interesting about it was docs, docs arrive at escrow and there's a third buyer. So, Naturally, escrow calls me and says, hey, did anybody tell you as the listing agent and the, the seller, the principal, that there were going to be three buyers? And I said, no, they didn't. So I call the agent on the other side, right? The selling agent. And I'm like, dude, what, what, right? He goes, Mike, I didn't know about this. Let me find out. I'll call you back. So he literally had not been told by the lender. Or by the way, if you're a lender, don't do this. Don't ever do this. But if you're a lender... Or, or a realtor, okay, or both, you need to let people know when this type of thing happens. And you need to let your borrowers know, your buyers know that when they do this, they need to let you know, okay? So here's what happened. These kids are grown, and I, they're kids, they're, they're in their 30s, but they're grown, they're grown children who are out of the house, they have two kids, the whole deal. The daughter had left her job she was in third round of, of interviews. This is the wife, okay? It's a husband and wife that are buying. So the, the wife had gone out and was on her third interview, and they literally bought our house. She was thinking that they were going to have plenty of time for her to do the third interview, join the company, get her first paycheck, all that kind of thing that you have to have for her loan. She went to go do the third interview, and something didn't, something didn't gel. There was something wrong that she didn't like about the company. <clears throat> she shared that with her husband, who shared that with his dad. His dad said, I will jump in. I will co-sign with you to help you qualify so that she doesn't have to go to work somewhere that she doesn't want to go to work for just because she's buying a house. Okay? So this co-signing thing happens every single day, and nobody talks about it. It literally just happened two weeks ago. Okay? Now, I got on the phone with the lender and I'm like, what are you doing, right? And he explained to me what happened. That's fine. Dad was magnanimous. He jumped, he, her father-in-law was magnanimous. He jumped in, he helped, okay? Here's the deal. I needed to hear from the lender specifically what it was that they were doing. And we ended up in a conversation that wasn't very pleasant because he was not happy about the fact that I was asking him specific questions about this deal. Long story short, he ended up thanking me at the end of the conversation because here's the deal. He got angry with me. I didn't get angry with him, but I explained to him exactly why I needed to make sure that I knew all the details. Okay. This dad who's co-signed on this loan was not going on title. That's a challenge, mm -hmm. especially when dad has an estate one of these days. 
Okay. So when dad, it, you know, God forbid dad dies one of these days, his, his estate could be challenged by an heir. That challenge to that estate could land us in court if we don't have something definitive that says that dad is choosing not to be on title. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So these are things you want to watch out for, but co-signing is something that's done every single day, every single day. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it helped them qualify. Their down payment came from the proceeds of their house. So they didn't need money. Okay. But let's talk about gift funds for a second. Let's talk about where you can go to source gift funds. I've had parents and I'm not necessarily recommending this, but I've had parents of my clients go out and take cash advances on credit cards to gift them the money. So you have to source it. You have to source where the money came from, but they don't, we don't care where the money came from because they don't have to repay it, right? We just have to track it. We have to be able to document it, okay? Now, can you as a borrower pay that donor back? Can you pay that person back that gifted you that money? Sure, you're just not required to, okay? Mm -hmm. and, they have to and they have to sign a letter that says that they're not gonna require that you repay it, okay? So I've had I've had people that have been at the same at the same employer for 10 years, parents, and they had a 401k, had a million dollars in it. Okay, great 401k. They were able to borrow against that 401k to gift the money to their kid. Okay, there are all kinds of different ways to do this. So let's talk about this for a second. Let's talk about the mentality. The mentality is you want to get started. You just want to get started, okay? And sometimes what you do is you buy a condo because it costs less. It's lower price of entry, right? Sometimes you, and this is what I did. So I'm going to give you an example of what I did personally, okay? Very first house I purchased with my, or very first property I purchased with my wife, we were married. We were going back and forth about where we were going to live because I was out in the field all the time in the mortgage business. I was gone all the time. So where I lived, I wanted to be somewhere central, you know, right? And so we ended up next to a freeway. So I ended up in a in an apartment next to a freeway, right on and off the freeway, um, which is what I preferred. And one day there was a door hanger on the door when I came home to the apartment. And I grabbed the door hanger and it was a list of properties that were owned by the VA. They were VA owned foreclosures, okay? And one of them happened to be on the same street we lived on, piqued my interest. So my wife comes home and I said, hey, why don't you why don't you go get changed? Why don't we go, let's go drive by this place. I'll take you to dinner, right? So we go drive by this place. Turns out I've seen it. I've been in the, in the models a couple of years prior and this property was available. So I reached out to the, to the broker that put the door hanger on the door, right? And he said, hey, Mike, he goes, you're a licensee because... I had to be a licensee to be in the mortgage business, a real estate licensee, right? Salesperson in the state of California. And so he said, hey, you're a licensee. Come by my house in Escondido. I'll, I'll give you the key and you can just go take your wife and go take a look. See if you like it. So I did. We went, we walked through it. You know what happened? We walked oh. in the door and it smelled brand new. Not joking. You know how, you know how carpet smells brand new? Mm -hmm. Walked in the door and it smelled brand new. I'm like, what in the world? So I start looking into it. It turns out this guy got into a fight, this veteran, got into a, bought, bought this condo, got into a fight with his girlfriend, went to jail, lost the property to foreclosure. He'd only lived in there less than six months. Wow. So that carpet literally is less than six months old. It still smelled brand new, okay? And it had been sitting vacant for two years. <clears throat> so, I, so it was on the market for $160,000. I told my wife, I said, they're going to lower it again. They may even lower it again. When it gets to 140,000, we're putting in an offer. So we got down to 140,000. I put in an offer at $140,050. Hmm. Why $50? Tell me. I'm not a veteran. Every veteran who has VA eligibility comes first. So I put in the, the bid at, at $140,050 and I got it. Hmm. And VA underwrote the paper. So VA loaned me the money at, at a lower interest rate that would have cost me $20,000 to buy down the points. I'm not joking. Okay. Fixed rate, 5% down, no mortgage insurance. I'm not a veteran and I got a VA loan, dude. Hmm. 
Okay. I don't think a lot of, I don't think a lot of people realize that's an option. You absolutely can do it. And so I, so I do that. Right. And by the way, all the 5% could have been a gift. I had the money, but it could have been a gift. VA would have allowed it. Okay. So I, we end up, we end up buying it. They finance it. We're in it for a couple of years. The market turns around because this was a time when the market was really rough. The market turns around and we make almost a hundred grand on this house or actually just over a hundred grand on this, on this condo. We turn around and buy and sell that and we buy our next place. We take the equity and we put it in the next house. That's a climber. Remember the climber camper mm -hmm. thing? Okay. Mm -hmm. So it can be done. It's we didn't put any money into that into that condo to speak of at all because it was practically brand new. Didn't right. Yep. Yeah. Right. So so the point I'm getting at is you might have to start a little smaller, right? You might have to start with a three bedroom, two bath, 1500 square foot stacked flat condo that you're in for a couple of years. And then you make your your equity, you make your appreciation and you sell it and move on to the next one, sure. especially in San Diego County. Right. In particular, when mm -hmm. the market turns around. Here's the deal. I have, we bought, we built a house in Escondido, brand new. Across the street from this house, it was what's called an infill project. So the, these new houses were infilled into a, they, they took a, an old avocado grove and, and, and dosed it, basically graded it and put houses in it. Well, we were in, we were in that old avocado grove and next door across the street from our place, there's a kid, kid, much younger than me, in his twenties, pulls up in a, he buys it, pulls up in a yellow Corvette, brand new yellow Corvette. And I'm talking yellow, yellow. Okay. Like yellow, like glow in the dark yellow. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, it, I, I paid attention. Right. So I went across the street. I'm like, I got to introduce myself to this kid. So I go across the street and I introduce myself to him. He's 26. Okay. This is his third house. Okay. And I'm like, so what do you do? He said, well, he said, I work during the day, but he said, what I do is I go buy properties that have outdated kitchens, outdated flooring, outdated bathrooms, the whole, the whole night. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he said, and what I do is I applied for a credit card with Lowe's and I applied for a credit card with Home Depot. Both of them gave me, gave, gave me credit cards. I put the kitchen remodel on one credit card like the Home Depot credit card. And I put the bathroom remodels, both of them on the Lowe's credit card. I, I do the flooring on the credit card, the whole thing. He said, I've made $700,000 on the last three houses. <clears throat> okay. Wow. 26 years old. He did that in three years. Okay. And what he did was he knew that kitchens and bathrooms sell houses. Okay. So he took the big ticket items and he put them on a credit card. And then when he sells the property, obviously he pays the credit card back off. They increase his credit limit. Now the kid has enough that he could do two or three houses at once. And he's on his third house. <clears throat> okay. Now this house, he fixed up. He did it the same model, the same thing that he did before. Sold it in seven months for $240,000 more than he paid for it. Okay. Now he had $50,000 in remodeling costs. So it wasn't you know, a total of 240,000 profit. Right. But he so made one, 200, almost, he made almost 200 grand on this house. Okay. And he was the next time he was going out, he was going to buy two at a time, but he was doing this every single year. And what I'm suggesting to, to people is this, <clears throat> if you're looking to buy a house, don't go out and try and buy the most expensive thing you possibly can. Go out and try and find something that maybe needs some work. Maybe it needs some flooring. Maybe yeah. it needs kitchens. Maybe it needs or kitchen and bathrooms, right? And then think about potentially putting, um, potentially putting it, you know, the the remodels on your credit cards. They're licensed contractors. <clears throat> you can do that. You can do this through Home Depot. You don't need to know anybody in the business or any of that kind of thing. But it's a way for you to gain equity. Now, are you going to live in the middle of a construction site? Yeah. Okay. There are some, there are some, some things that you're going to have to deal with, but if you get to where you start doing this on a consistent basis, you can really get to a place to where you can build wealth quickly without a soup, without a huge amount of risk. Yeah. Okay. There are ways to do this. And I'll tell you years ago, <clears throat> and I mean, 44 years ago, 
My parents bought their first house in California. Pardon me. They bought their first house in California. For what price? It was just under a hundred grand. Oh my! Like Ninety-eight thousand yeah. dollars. Can you imagine? By the way, that same house. You ready for this? Oh, that man. same house just seven sold figures. seven figures for a million two hundred and fifty grand. Unbelievable! My parents were blown away, completely blown away. So one of the things that we did was we bought. They bought this house, and it had the most awful, awful wallpaper. It had the most awful tile, um, vinyl um, flooring. Okay. Well, they put a, they put a, a spray, a spray bottle and a scraper in my hand and said, go to work. And my job was to take the, was to, was to wet down the wallpaper, take the wallpaper off. <clears throat> they also gave me a, a flat bladed shovel and said, go to work, get this, get this vinyl flooring up. You would not believe how much glue they use on vinyl flooring, dude. It is insane. I know because I've had to bring it up. Yeah, okay. I've heard that. I've heard that. Yep. But they literally bought a property that was a fixer for $98,000. Okay. They later sold it for quite a bit more and they'd only been there like three or four years. They sold it for quite a bit more because it had been remodeled. It had been freshly painted, all this kind of stuff. Right. They did all that themselves. Yeah. Okay. The point I'm getting at is there are ways to make this work. Okay. My parents now live in a place that has over a million dollars in equity in it. Wow. Okay. But but they had to they had to improve it over time. They had to do certain things over time. Okay. So there are ways to make this work. You just almost have to think in terms of this is a building process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We got to start a little smaller. Can, you know, do you have to put some of your stuff in storage and maybe buy a place that's a three bedroom, two bath that's a thousand square feet and start there? and not be able to put all of your stuff in the house? Yeah, you may have to do that. You may have to start with a condo like I did. You may have to do a number of different things, right? I bought a new house out here two two and a half years ago. We just sold it. We made $250,000 on it. Okay? We didn't do anything to it except we put landscaping in. That's all we did. What was the, I mean, but, but that, the, Explain. Like, I mean, it's not, I think from an outside looking in, it can look at, it can, it can appear as, all right, well, that's easy. I can do that. But that's not that easy. And there are horror stories. So maybe give an explanation of, of why it appeared to be easy for you. Well, I've been doing this a while. So the idea of buying real estate is not risky for me. I've done thousands and thousands of real estate transactions in my in my time. Um, so buying a house, selling a house, that kind of stuff is not, is not something that I find risky. What I find risky is sitting, a, sitting, sitting idly by and watching the rest of the market get away from you yeah. or sitting idly by and not getting in the game and getting started. Because here's the thing. We know from the National Association of Realtors that the average homeowner in North America, not, not California, not San Diego, the average homeowner nationwide has a net worth of over $300,000. Yeah. The average tenant has a net worth of less than $8,000. Okay. If that's not incentive enough, by the way, that Delta, that $292,000 Delta, <clears throat> that Delta is what people use for retirement. That's what people use to send their kids to college. That's okay. So there's something else that's going on too, that, that, I know we weren't going to talk about here, but it is happening. It is real. Mm -hmm. Prior to 2008, there were tens of millions of home loans underwritten by subprime mortgage holders, mortgage companies. Okay. Mm -hmm. There are people out there that still have those mortgages today. I just in 2018 sold a house for some clients of mine. They have been paying on 400 thousand dollars in debt they had been paying four thousand two hundred and fifty dollars a month wow okay mm -hmm. from from for for the for basically um 12 years so from 2006 to 2018 they've been paying four thousand two hundred and fifty dollars a month here's what happened they were paying it because they signed a note saying that they would pay it 
They were staying faithful to their word, okay? But in the process, they never bought a new house, a new car. They never sent, they didn't send their kids to college because they couldn't afford it. They shut off all the, all the landscaping. They shut or got rid of all the landscaping because the water bill was too high. Okay. They had a leak in the wall that they couldn't fix because they didn't have the money to fix it. Eesh. Okay. Their house went from brand new dream house, live in it forever to it's a fixer. And they, when they called me, they were $38,000 behind delinquent on their mortgage. Okay. Wow. wow. And, yeah. and, what, and what, what miracle were they hoping you were going to turn? Well, they were, they were hoping I could sell their house and recoup the $250,000 that they put down on it. Now we did recoup 200,000 of it, but the 50 grand went away. Okay. Well, naturally, naturally they were upside down. What'd they expect? Well, yeah, but it's a fixer, right? I mean, it's, they literally just ran this thing. And the, and the, by the way, the flooring, the flooring had been in there for the entire 12 years. So what do you think the flooring looked like? Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. it's just, you know, and so the long and the short of it is we got, we got them, we got them out from under this thing, but here's what I want you to think about. <clears throat> there are tens of millions of those loans still in force. There are people still making those payments. And I would submit to you that our economy is being is being handicapped because of partly because of that. Okay. People can't afford to send their kids to college. They can't afford new cars. They can't afford to take vacations. They can't afford to put money back into the economy because literally all their money's going towards this mortgage. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just it's just part of it, right? Yeah. So the long and the short of it is, yes, there are a million horror stories. There are a million different things you need to watch out for. But there are, you know, buying a house is, in fact, the American dream for most people. It's not for some, okay? Some people, it's just not, you know, the whole idea of owning a home scares them to death, okay? The long and the short of it is this. Buying a home is basically a forced savings account. It's a forced mm -hmm. savings plan, Okay. Mm -hmm. And I tell realtors this all the time. When you go on a listing appointment, your seller is going to think that their house is worth $80,000 more than the house down the street that just sold. That's actually superior to theirs. Why? Because they spent the weekend as a landscaper when they weren't a landscaper. They got a sun, they got a sunburn. They didn't, they'll never forget all this stuff because they needed to put sprinklers in. Okay. Mm -hmm. They, they gave up going on this vacation because they had a house payment to make. They gave up certain things they sacrificed. Just like you sacrifice for your children, you sacrifice for this house. They remember all that, okay? It's been decades that they've been sacrificing for this particular, for this property. So to them, in their mind's eye, this property is worth way more than any other property on the market. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so don't be surprised or shocked when you go out there and they and they really do believe in their heart of hearts that this property is worth more. OK, so there's a loan program that was just released out here. I don't know if it's available outside of California, but I know it's available in San Diego. <clears throat> there's a company called our uh, credit union called Mission Federal Credit Union, and they have a loan program where they'll actually give you fifty thousand dollars to buy a house. You can use it for down payment. You can use it for it's like it's like a two hundred and some million dollar fund that they started. What is um, it? What is it? A grant? It's a grant. So you don't have to pay it back. You can use it for down payment. You can use it for closing costs. You can use it for anything you want to use it for. So what are the stipulations? Well, you have you have qualifications in terms of like income limits, but a family of four can make up to two hundred and ten thousand dollars a year to qualify. Which is which is relatively poverty in California. <laughs> yeah, well, it's kind of it's kind of a small number, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. but it but it is it is a, a decent number in terms of what you can in fact afford. So there are you know there are limitations to it, but it's something that is available. And the reason I'm saying this and the reason I'm bringing it up <laughs> is there are a lot of programs out there that are available to first time home buyers and home buyers that are getting back into the market that have some stipulations. There are some restrictions and where you can buy and how much money you can make and all that kind of thing. Right. Mm. And they are out there and they are available. 
So you can, in fact, buy a house with zero down if you absolutely have to. There are ways to make it work. Now, you may have to, because interest rates are higher right now, you may have to look at buying a lesser house, right? So not quite as much house as you, as you want necessarily. But just remember, this is a process. The key to this is get started, okay? Figure out a way to get started. You can, you can text or you can Google first-time homebuyer programs in your county, right? And there's a whole bunch of them that'll show up. Now, some of them run out of money pretty quickly. So you need to get geared up, get with your lender and get, get in place, get in line so that, you can, so that you can get one of these, right? There's a thing called mortgage credit certificates. There's a thing call, out here um, that allows you to, called CHAFA, that allows you to buy property with, um, less, with less of, a, of an interest rate. So it's a lower interest rate, right? <clears throat> you have to stay in the property for 10 years though. So there are restrictions. There are things that you, and you have to own or occupy, you can't rent it. Right. You have to buy in certain areas, certain census tracts, that kind of thing. But it's it's important to understand that the best part, the best thing you can do is get started. The best thing you can do is educate yourself, mm -hmm. right? Go find yourself somebody that's a loan officer that knows what they're doing and cares and will advise you, okay, mm -hmm. where you're not just a number, okay? And go find yourself a realtor that cares. Go find yourself a realtor that will help get you going, okay? Yeah. So I'm going to tell you a little story. A few years ago, I got a phone call from a from a very, very young lady. She's 22 years old. She had just graduated from college. And she her parents were wanting her to move back to the East Coast. She had just graduated from college out here, and she wanted to stay out here. <clears throat> and she really wanted to buy this condo. It's an $80,000 condo. OK, now understand the median home price in San Diego County right now is just under a million dollars. OK, so it's on the lower side of and back then it was probably 600 grand. OK, but nobody in the real estate industry would call her back. She called me and she said, I heard you on the radio. She said, I'm wondering if you can help me or maybe you can point me to somebody who can help me. I said, what do you need? And she said, I'm looking to buy this condo in Escondido. I said, okay. And she said, and I and I really, you know, I've saved up the money. I've got the money for the down payment out of my own pocket. You know, I'm I'm ready to go. It's an FHA deal, right? We found out, we figured out that the that the condominium complex, that the HOA was in fact on the FHA approved list, the whole thing. We went in, we put an offer in. I, showed, I took her out and showed it to her, put an offer in. She never once mentioned to me, her, her background. She never once mentioned to me or family or I didn't, I didn't ask, you know, I just, I was there to help her. Okay. She was my client. So we get everything closed, finished up about, a, about two weeks after we close, I get this phone call and it's from her dad who happens to be the CEO of a very, very, very large corporation. And he's calling me from the company's jet hmm. and he's calling me and he's practically in tears trying to trying to thank me for helping his baby daughter mm. because nobody else would help her. Nobody would return her phone calls. As soon as they found out that it was an $80,000 condo, they told her that it wasn't worth their time. Oh my God. Okay. Just here's what I want you to think about. That young lady now is worth a bunch of money. She's, she's lived in that condo. She's now turned around and rented that condo out. She's now gone out and bought her another house. OK, she's accumulating wealth without the help of her family. She's accumulating wealth and she's doing it using the exact same system that we're talking about. That that condo that she bought had old flooring, old kitchen, old bathroom. It was a one one. OK, everything was old. She went out and had the kitchen remodeled, had the bathroom remodeled, had the new flooring put in the whole thing, the whole nine. OK, new windows, the whole thing. Now she's rented it out for more money and she took a, she took a line of credit out and she's gone out and bought another house. Okay. She's building her real estate portfolio at a little bit at a time, but she's building her real estate portfolio. It absolutely can be done. Yeah. You just have to be willing to have the right mindset and apply the principles that we're talking about. Right. You absolutely can do it. And by the way, in case you're wondering if I give this advice to people every day, Last week, I was at a, a flippers um, deal, a meeting for, for, for real estate flippers, right? <clears throat> and I used to work for 
and run acquisitions for the number two flipper in San Diego County. And the one of the people that worked there has now moved on and is working somewhere else. And she reached out to me and she said, hey, you know more about real estate than anybody I know. Would you be willing to talk to meet with me and my fiance? We want to get into the flipping business. So he comes to the flipping meeting with me. I invited him. Okay. And we're standing there talking. This is literally last week. We're standing there talking. And I asked him, I said, hey, I said, have you thought anything? Have you thought at all about buying? Because they're both working. Would you, have you thought at all about buying a place just for you guys and then remodeling it while you live there and then turning around and selling it potentially or, or renting it out, right? And he said, well, you know, I've talked to her about it, but it's not something she really wants to do. But he said, I literally just did this with my son. I did all the remodeling myself for my son and mm -hmm. my son made a hundred grand plus on this, on this condo. Wow. Okay. So I'm not talking about something that isn't used every single day. It's used every single day and it works everywhere. It works everywhere. Now, numbers are going to vary, right? If you buy a place in Mississippi and you fix it up and resell it, you might not make as much as you'll make in San Diego. Okay. So just, just be aware. Okay. Yeah, right. But there are people it's all, that are it's making, all relative. It's all relative. Exactly. But there are people that are doing really, really well in Tampa using this exact strategy that I know of. I know personally, there are people in North Carolina that are, that are doing this. There are people in Orlando that are doing this. There are people in San Diego that are doing this. So the point I'm getting at is it can be done. It's just a matter of having the right mentality and making sure that you do your homework. Okay. Ask every question you can possibly think of. And then when you run out of questions, ask the practitioner, ask the professional, if there's any questions that you should have asked that you didn't ask. Yeah. Okay. That's yep. how you limit. That's how you limit your exposure. That's how you limit your potential nightmare scenario or your, your bad story. Okay. You know, what do you call it? A million nightmare scenarios or something? I don't know. Right. Don't know. Well, there's all yeah. kinds of, there's all kinds of horror stories is what you call it. Yeah, right. Sure, sure. So there's stories. all yeah. kinds of horror stories. The way you limit that being you is you ask, ask, ask. Yeah. And then when you run out of questions, you keep asking. Yeah. I think I think it is a mindset shift. Um, you know, some of the things that I've heard really with the with that generation are there's there's also a bit of a, a exaggerated or uh, you know an expectation that is tainted, and yeah. and and I think a lot of that has to do with the the world that we now live in through social media, where we yeah. see so much that just isn't really reality, including the way people look. I mean, yeah. you know, oftentimes you see somebody on social, you see them in real life, you're like, oh God, that's not what I saw on social because they've yeah. been filtered, right? And yeah. and so I think the expectation, the expectation for older generations was always that I'm going to buy a starter home. Mm -hmm. And when I buy my first car, like it's going to be a piece of junk. Like that's mm -hmm. just the way we were raised. Yeah. And I think nowadays that that expectation has shifted and it's, it, I think as a real estate agent, the, the, the one thing that I've learned, Mike, is I've been having these conversations and I'm not kind of like studying this, you know, yeah. really trying to understand the psychology is that our, our tendency as someone that's our age and older is, is to, is to parent them, mm -hmm. uh, maybe even coach them. And mm -hmm. I think it comes across as parenting and they don't want to hear it. They don't want right. to hear us tell them not to buy the cup of coffee. Right. And, right. and so I think what, what we have to do is try to learn how to display empathy to them yeah. and kind of get inside of their psyche and, and help them understand everything that you just described, maybe get into some house hacking tips, which, you know, y'all know about house hacking and, you know, renting a room, renting a basement, doing the things that you can do before you build your own family. Right. When mm -hmm. you have some flexibility, uh, but I think most importantly is just understanding that there's that almost a shift backwards in their expectation, mm -hmm. but also with a lens to the future, which is, is this really what you potentially want to happen, which is governmental control or corporate control of our lives, which is what's right. going to happen if you don't own real estate, because no matter which way you slice it, I don't, I, and I can say this to any generation, literally from, from one to, to 99, uh, we're not good savers naturally. Mm -hmm. 
it's it's a it's a small it's a small minority that actually can save and even the great savers will tell you that they're not capable of saving to the extent of how you can earn from real estate and yeah. that's the data is it's just data it's not me or mike trying to sell anyone anything and i know that our audience is real estate agents you believe this you know this but how you articulate that and again, empathize with the younger generations is going to be the difference between, you know, how much business you acquire from those generations because things are changing yeah. and we've got to evolve and change with them. You can't continue to do the things the way we've always done them. So I'm going to give you an example of something that happened just a couple of years ago. And <clears throat> this was this was not my deal. It was a realtor that came to a training that I taught. OK, and she called me up and she said, Mike. I have this, I have the most impossible clients. And I said, okay, what, what happened? And she said, well, I met the mom at a, at a recital that my kids, my kids go to the same school, our, our kids go to the same school, met her at a recital. And she said, and, and she was telling me that they were going to have to move. And the reason they were going to have to move was because they'd been in the same property for 10 years that they'd been renting in that district. OK, because they wanted those schools in particular, they'd been renting there for, for 10 years and they had and the seller was now the landlord had let them know that they were now going to be selling the house. They needed them to move out so they could remodel and get the place ready, all that. And she said, I don't know what we're going to do. There's nothing available in our area. And I'm kind of freaking out here. And so this realtor who had been to the train, the training that I had done said, you know, well, let me ask you a question what have you thought at all about buying have you thought at all about potentially owning in this area where you really want to your kids to go to school until they're you know and the kids had another i think it's eight years altogether i think the kids had another eight years of, of school left before they graduated from high school okay and so she was telling her she's like you know we we really dearly want, don't want to send them to a different school where they have to make new friends and all that kind of thing and so she started asking her questions and basically this, 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 this mom just kind of shut her down. Okay. And so she called me and said, what do I do? What do I do? She's like, you, you seem to be so good at communicating with clients and I'm just hitting this brick wall. And I said, well, I said, let me ask you a question. Does she seem like somebody who, who responds to numbers? Does she seem like somebody who would care about numbers? And she goes, well, yeah, actually, she does. And so I said, okay, well, let me ask you a question. What if you went and sat with her with a blank pad, blank pad, blank piece of paper and said, let me ask you this. How much have you paid in rent per month for the last 10 years? Okay. Yeah. The answer is $4,000 a month for 10 years. That's $480,000 that she's paid in rent. Okay. And there's mm -hmm. the next question. If you owned that house, how much would that house have appreciated in the last 10 years? Mm -hmm. There was a great recession in the middle of this, Mr. Fitzer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right in the middle of all this was a great recession. What do you think that property appreciated in the 10 year period that she lived there renting? Give me the dates. Give me the years. So they moved in in 2006. Okay. Okay. And they 16. lived there for 10 years. Okay. So there, so what do you think, what do you think, what do you think is possible? Well, what market? Well, it's San Diego County and it's a nice, it's a nice, um, it's one of the more sought after school districts. So it did, it did so, pretty well. So a normal market, I would say a hundred to 200,000. Right. Uh, San Diego, half a mil. Yeah. So $600,000. Okay. So, they have now lost $600,000 in appreciation and they've lost $480,000 in rent. We're now a million eighty thousand dollars upside down. Now here's another question. How much of the seller's mortgage did they pay down mm, in that 10 yeah. year period? 100%. The answer is 200 grand. Okay, so we got 200 grand plus a million 80,000. I don't know if we're if we're if we're counting this right, but it's we're literally at almost a million 3 that they've lost in 10 years. That's $130,000 a year, Mr. Fitzer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. You with me? And here's the other thing. 
They do not control their own destiny. They literally have to move when the landlord decides that it's time for them to move. Yeah. And if there's no, if there's no, um, if there's no um, inventory available, if there's nowhere for them to move, they're literally going to have to move out of the school district. Yeah. How yeah, does that and that's the feel. Well, and that, and that, you know, just to give the context too, is, is I did the same thing on in recent times, uh, same 10 year run on a average American home, which was mm -hmm. 300 something thousand. And the, the rent savings, uh, assuming today's numbers, which was a, over a thousand, it was a thousand twenty seven a month mm -hmm. savings renting versus a starter home mortgage, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, over 10 years, the difference was a was 165,000 equity gain plus principal buy down versus $15,000 in rent versus mortgage savings, assuming they maintained a 7% interest rate for all 10 years. And we all know they probably would have refinance, right? So right. Um, so the, the net gain was 150K in that yeah. 10 years on an average, you're talking middle of, middle of the, the country kind of, of scenario. Mm -hmm. Tell me anyone in a you know, a teaching career, uh, 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 a trades career, uh, mm -hmm. you know, any normal career who can save 150 K over 10 years. I don't right. think it's possible. Yeah. yeah. Real estate is the way to go. Yep. Home ownership is the way to go. Yep. And the, the moral to all this is you've just got to find a way. Yeah. You've got to, uh, you've got to adopt the appropriate mindset. Okay. Now, I know we haven't talked about my podcast, but that's my podcast, The Michael Litton Experience. And one of the things that I've done is I have I have interviewed people like you who are incredibly successful and incredibly accomplished in their careers. And you know what's interesting? They all had the same mentality, just like you have, where they figured out a way to make it work. There are a lot of people that I've interviewed that have gone, wanted to go to work for a particular company or a particular mentor or a particular, particular person of influence, okay? And they've literally gone to them and said, I'll work for free. Mm -hmm. I'll work for free. That's a different mentality than what that young man that posted that video had. Yeah. You with me? Yep. I'll work for free. I don't care what it takes. I just want to learn. I don't care what it takes. I just want to, I just want to be a part of this. It's a building process and you have to sacrifice in order to build. It's just like anything else, right? If you're going to build a big, beautiful house, does it become a mess for a while while you're building it? Sure. Do you have to tear things down to build it up? Sure. Do you have to grade? Do you have to make, you have to make ugly things? Yeah. Do you have, does, do you cause a mess? Sure. Does it look like a bomb went off for like three months? Sure. Yeah. But when you're done, it's pretty. Mm -hmm. When you're done, it's a show place, right? When you're with me, you got to just be willing to, to do the ugly things to get to where it is that you want to be. Yeah. And that's ultimately what it boils down to. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Mike, if somebody wants to uh, get connected to you, remind them how to do so. Probably the best thing is LinkedIn. Just look up Mike Litton on LinkedIn. Um, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. All my contact information is on there. By the way, if you click on the link that says contact info, my contact info is actually on there. If you're on LinkedIn and you're in business and you want to do business, put your contact information in the contact link. AKA phone number, email. Right. Not a LinkedIn link. The LinkedIn link takes you back to their profile. It's yeah. a loop. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. But yes, all my contact information is on there. Awesome. Mike, it's always a pleasure, man. I know we're going to continue to do this because topics come up and they're worth discussing. And this is, you know, I, I, I don't think we can stress enough that I do. I firmly believe, and I, I think you agree with me that the future of your real estate career uh, is going to lie in your ability to evolve. Yeah. And that's going to include your evolution of, of communication mm -hmm. to a different set of human beings who don't want to be communicated to how we were, yeah. how we did and, and, uh, and marketed to, and, and, and understanding all of these various, uh, you know, revolutionary mm -hmm. tools and resources that 
whether you like it or not, it's changing. And I, I always yeah. tell people, Mike, I'm like, you have two choices, you know, you can retire mm -hmm. um, or, or you can, you can decide to change. You don't, you can be mad about it, but you can do mm -hmm. something about it. Uh, yeah. Or you can just say, well, I got to continue to work. So if I'm going to continue to work, I'm either going to find another career. I'm going to find a way to evolve. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, what's going to have to happen. Mike, you're always a, always a pleasure. One last thing, yes, please. the bedrock, the absolute bedrock of effective human communication is questions. The better you get at asking questions, the more effective yes. you'll be as a communicator. Guaranteed. So true. So true. Be a better listener and yeah. ask questions. It makes people, yeah, that, that's, that's good. Awesome. Appreciate you, buddy. Thank you. Likewise. Take care. You too. Agents Podcasts.